But you know, you get that recorder going and it seems to be, it just takes over. And what Paul is saying here in Ephesians is you have to re-record. You have to put the right information on the recorder. And then you have to play the right tape. And if you don't play the right tape, be certain the wrong one will play. And if you choose not to bring your mind under control, then the devil will certainly control it for you. It is his nature and his desire to attack us, and he attacks us in our mind. And he fills us with all kinds of garbage that if you tell yourself, you know, you tell a child, if you tell a child you're stupid every day, hey, stupid, how's it going? Hey, stupid, how'd you do in school today? Hey, stupid, how'd you... What will that kid think he is in five years? Stupid. So we know that, but do we apply it to our own lives and say, what recording am I listening to? Who has said so many things to us that we believe to be true that aren't true? What's so interesting is that we are able to listen to a recording so long that we actually believe it to be true. If a person repeats something enough, often enough, and loud enough, everyone will begin to believe it's true. Someone in your life could be telling you things that, that they have said for so long that you think they're really true. And Paul is saying in Ephesians, don't sit there. Get to the right place. Believe what God says to be true. And you have to stand out and decide what's true in this world. But there is one thing you can do. You can go to God's word and get his truth about you. About you. And so uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about sitting in who you are in Christ. And you look at the first chapter and you say, in Christ. Remember, it's in here 27 times in this little book of Ephesians. So in Christ is important. And who we are in Christ, we said as a, uh, the Father chooses us, predestines us, adopts us. The Son redeems us, forgives us, and gives us an inheritance. We said the Holy Spirit seals us as a pledge. And now, what are you supposed to remember? So look at verse 1 in chapter 2. And I, I've given you um, a sheet of paper with uh, certain lines on it there where it talks about uh, remember. Uh, remember who you were outside of Christ. What's the first verse say about who you were outside of Christ? Go ahead and yell it out. Dead. 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 That's the first one you can put down there. Dead. And dead, if you want to just write the entire thing, you can put dead in your trespasses and sins. Stuck in the mud, if you want, beside that. Don't write that below it, but beside it. Stuck and can't get out. Incapable of getting out. Dead people don't move. Dead people don't control anything any longer. Dead people can't do anything. And what you have here is a description of us outside of Christ, dead to God, unable to speak to him, unable to hear him, unable to relate to him. People without Jesus are dead. Get over the idea in America today that everyone's going to heaven or most people are going to heaven. Most people are dead in their trespasses and sins. That means they're in a whole kingdom ruled by sin. Their ruler is not God. Their ruler is the evil one, the devil. Their ruler is their passions. They're outside of God's kingdom. They are in dire need of being brought alive. Think about the free people you work with, the friends you go to school with, the, the, the neighbors you have. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. You get a picture like that and you start thinking, people are dead. Girls, people are dead without Jesus. Dead. And you and I were like that. Now think about being in, in, a, in quicksand up to your neck. Can you imagine that? You're in quicksand. It's up to your neck. And you look up. And there's no one who can pull you out. And you try to lift your hands, you cannot get your hands up out of quicksand. And you know 
that it's up to here, and any longer it's going to be here, and then it's here, and then it's here, and then you're going to watch until you suffocate. There is no hope. Dead. And then Jesus reaches down, and he grabs a hold of you and pulls you out. Who you were outside of Christ was a person up to his neck in quicksand, dead. And God is reaching out to you and saying, I want you, and pulls you out. That's what happened when you got saved. Remember what it was like outside of Christ. What's the second thing? It's in verse 2. Okay, disobedient would be a good word. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, now the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. I put down dominated by the evil one. Disobedient, dominated by the evil one. He rules the life of a person outside of Christ. You know how interesting it is that people say that they don't, uh, they do whatever they want. Do people do what they want? No, they do what their passions tell them. There are people who are on a destructive course in their lives, going to ruin everything in their lives, and yet they'll tell you they're doing what they want. And you look at them and you say, yeah, you are. You're doing what your passions are driving you to do. But no one in their right mind tries to ruin their own lives, do they? Not really. So why does a person destroy their own lives? Because they're run by their passions. And they're dominated by the evil one. And they ruin their own lives. And they ruin other people's lives. Determined to do what they want. No. This word says you didn't do what you wanted. You did what you were told. That's what this verse says. Listen, look at what it says. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom. You were a follower. Some people say, no, I'm the leader. I go where I want. No, you're a follower. The question is, who are you following? Everybody's a follower. And what Paul is saying here is, there, don't forget, because outside of Christ, you were following evil and you were disobedient. But you were a follower. It used to be so interesting to listen to teenagers talk about how they're wearing their style. I'm my own person. I'm doing my own thing. Yeah, right. You and all the other kids your age. Everybody's wearing this today, and everybody says they're being unique. Really? Today, it's a matter of tattoos and piercings. Really? I haven't seen as many followers today as I do now. People who follow other people doing what they do. Like, listen, you want to be free, you stop following the world. And you start following Jesus. Then you're free. That's when you're free. So outside of Christ, dead, and a follower of the evil one. The third thing is in verse uh, 3. All of us also lived among them at, at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. What do you, how would you summarize that? How would you summarize that in a little phrase or a couple of words? In verse 3, huh? Selfish to our own end. Selfish to our own end? Okay. You can put that. I just put gratifying my cravings, whatever I feel like. Pretty much the same thing. Feels good, do it. Following my cravings, following its desires and thoughts. Well, that, that I, the, the next line I put, following my desires. So gratifying my cravings and following my desires and thoughts. In other words, when we were outside of Christ, we did what 
felt good. We did what we thought would be good for us. Now listen, people. We do the same thing as Christians. You have to be really careful. You have to be awfully careful that you don't fall into living like you're outside the truth and outside of Christ. Just because something feels good doesn't make it right. Now, we all know that, but look at your own life. Do you do what's right because it's right? Or do you do what feels good because it feels good? Do you um, get your kids to do things because it's right or because it makes you feel good? Do you do something for your husband or your wife because it makes you feel good or because it's the right thing to do? You have to be really careful that you don't operate out of your own passions and desires outside of God and determine, God, is this what you want me to do? Is this how you want me to live? Is this the life you want my child to be, be like? Is this, you, you, as you raise your kids, your job is to teach them this is the kind of person God wants you to be. I've seen too many parents live their lives and their kids. Been around long enough time to watch and be very, very disheartened by parents who live through their kids. It's not healthy, and it's not healthy for the child. And you look at this verse and you say, I don't live by my passions gratifying my feelings. I get my feelings and I get, bring them under submission to the Holy Spirit and I let God's Spirit rule my emotions. And therefore, it's different than those inside, outside of Christ. Those outside of Christ, they just operate like that. It just seems like the natural thing to do, the right thing to do. It just makes me feel good. It satisfies. Don't I deserve this? We have a world full of people who deserve everything. They deserve a meal. They deserve health care. They deserve a car. Uh, they deserve a cell phone. We have somebody this week advocating that every person ought to be... It is, no, it is a right in America to have a cell phone. And if you can't afford a cell phone, the government should uh, supply you one. I heard that and I listened and I watched and I thought, what have we become? We've become a nation of dependent people on the government to give them things. Why do we do that? Because outside of Christ, we live according to our cravings and our desires and our passions. As a Christian, we don't do that. We live according to what God says and what he wants. Look at verse uh, 12. I'm going to skip some verses. Look at verse 12. What does it say about what to remember you were like? Separate from Christ. And without hope. Separated from Christ and without any hope. I have absolutely no hope. It's like the person in the quicksand, no hope. There is no getting out without him. Hopeless. What does it make you feel when you have the picture of being in quicksand up to your neck and Jesus reaches down and pulls you out? What's the response to that? What's your response to that picture? Thank you. Thank you. What else? My life. Grateful. What? Oh, my life to him. Hmm? Relief. Relief? Yeah. What else? Anything else? Man, that's a God you want to serve. A God who would reach down and grab you out. You were hopeless outside of Christ. Are you hopeless now? Don't listen to that bad recording. <laughs> Are you hopeless now? No. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not hopeless. I'm not without strength. I'm not without hope. I'm not without the power to accomplish. I'm not without the ability to change. Before I was hopeless dead in my trespasses and sins, outside of Christ, outside of the kingdom, 
following my passions, following whatever I felt like doing, doing whatever came along, didn't matter, and now God has reached down and pulled me out of the quicksand of life, and he has put me on his solid rock, and now I can do all things through Christ. Now I don't have to be like that. I now know Christ personally. Where I was separated, now I am united. Where I used to not be able to hear him speak, I can hear him. You don't have to be an adult to hear God. You can be a child. In fact, children sometimes often hear him much better than adults. They're not so jaded and uh, cynical. Little kids aren't cynical. Listen, God talks to his children. What was it like outside of Christ? Dead in your trespasses and sins. Dominated by your passions. Dominated by the evil one. Separated from God. Only doing what my cravings are. Unable to do anything about it. And hopeless. Remember. Remember what used to be. Remember how you used to feel. When there was no hope. Remember how it was when you couldn't stop doing something because of the passions and cravings of your heart. Don't forget what you were. It helps you remember what God has done for you. So let's consider what did God do. Let's look at verse 5. What did he do in verse 5? What did God do for you in verse 5? Made you alive with Christ. I love the King James word. Anybody know what the King James word is here? Quickened. Oh, you got King James? You just know it. Quickened. I like that word. Quickened. Quickening. God made you alive. You didn't do that. You didn't make yourself alive. You didn't sometimes say, I'm going to pull myself up my bootstraps and do better. I'm going to make myself alive. You didn't do that. God did that. Don't forget who brought you to life. Don't forget the one who reached down into the quicksand and pulled you out. Don't forget, he gave you life. Now, by life here, he means that you are now able to communicate with God, that you're now able to, to uh, speak to him. But look what it says, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. It is grace that saves us. God did not look at you and say, you're such a wonderful person. You've done so well. Come on up. I'm reaching out for you. He looked at you as a desperate, needy person, up to his neck in the quicksand, dead in your trespasses, unable to do anything about it, and he reached down and he pulled you out and he gave you life. That is something to remember. What you have to remember about God is he reached down and gave you life by his grace. His grace. His mercy meant that he was not going to give you judgment. His mercy meant he wasn't going to push you down lower into this quicksand. <laughs> and you just see somebody, no, you're going down. <laughs> all right? His mercy is that he didn't push you all the way down. His grace is that he reached out and pulled you out. We deserve to sink. We deserve punishment for being in our dead in our trespasses and sins. Mercy says, I won't punish you. Grace says, I'll pull you out. And by his grace, we're saved. Remember God's grace for you. Now look at the second thing. It's in verse 6. What else does he do? Or maybe the question should be, where are you? Answer the question, where are you, for this one in verse 6. With Christ, where? Seated in the heavenlies. Now this we call positional truth. This in theological terms is positional truth. That we have a position in Christ. I'd say, well, where are you? You'd say, well, I'm at the YMCA in Independence, Missouri. Okay, or you could say, I'm in America. Or you could say, I'm on the earth. Or you could say, I'm on a chair. There are lots of ways to express where you are. What this verse is talking about is where God sees you. 
Now, where does God see you? Yes, he sees you on that chair. Yes, he sees you in Independence. Yes, he sees you at the YMCA. Yes, he sees you in America and on the earth. But where does this verse say God sees you? He sees you in Christ in heaven. He sees you as a finished work in Christ. And positionally we say, where am I? I am in Christ in heaven. I am seated with him in the heavenlies. I am not here, I am there in God's mind. Now understand that God is over time, not controlled by time, not, there no beginning, no end. God sees everything at once and he sees you as a finished work in him. And he sees you in Christ in, in the heavenlies. Stop seeing yourself like the world sees you. Oh, I'm in a mess. No, you're not. You're with Christ in the heavenlies. Now live up to who you are. Stop wallowing in the mess. Stop acting like you're someone still stuck in your quicksand. Stop living like you have no hope. Stop living like you're in this world and you're stuck here. You have a home in heaven and you have a father who loves you and you have a God who has by his grace pulled you out and giving you strength and the ability to accomplish great things. Stop living the wrong recording. Start remembering where you're really, really seated. You're a child of the king and you're sitting down beside him. All right, look at verse 8. What has he done for you in verse 8? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Saved by grace. Saved by grace through faith. So faith is the vehicle by which God demonstrates get grace to us. And how did you get the get grace? Uh, how did you get the faith? It's a gift of God. Say, I did it all by myself. No. This verse is an interesting verse. So it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this. I'm going to decide what this is. I have to decide in English, I suppose, but in, actually in, in Greek. What does the, what's the antecedent of this? Well, the most common pro, pro, process in English to determine what this applies to is, the rule in English is, that you go to the first noun preceding the this. So what's the first noun preceding this? In English lesson today. What's the first noun preceding this? Before this? Hmm. Faith. And the answer in Greek is exactly the same. It is that faith, and this is not from yourself, it, meaning faith, is a gift from God. It is God who pulls you out. It is not your faith that pulled you out. Faith is not a work that you did. Faith is a gift from God that you were able to look up to him and say, I need you. I give my life to you. Pull me out, Lord. I submit to you. Those are all expressions of faith. God, help me. Oh, God, I am, I am a wicked person. Would you forgive me? Those are all expressions of faith that God puts in you to speak. And when you speak them, he pulls you out by his grace. He does not have to. God does not have to pull you out. He doesn't have to pull anyone out. God is completely happy to not pull anyone out. He is content in himself. He is fulfilled in himself. He needs nothing. He chooses to pull us out by his grace and his love. Don't ever think that God is less than who he is if he doesn't save everyone. He is not. He doesn't have to save anyone, but he chooses to. That's mercy and grace. And he gives us faith so that he can pull us out. He gives us faith. We look up. He grabs us and pulls us out. God has done great things. That's what you put in your recording. Look at verse uh, well, actually, I have two things out of eight. One is saved by grace, and the other is he gave us faith to believe. And in verse 9, why did God do that? 
Verse 9 says, not by works so that no one can boast. Why did God save us by grace through faith? And that isn't of ourselves. God gave it to us. So no one could brag. That's the next one. Don't forget. God did it by grace so you couldn't talk about how great you are, how great I am. See, what right do we have to say anything? We're all just a bunch of little sinners stuck in the quicksand, dead in their trespasses and sins, outside of the kingdom of God, without any hope, stuck to and clinging to our passions and desires, failing to do whatever God really wants, only doing what the enemy tells us to do, not any faith to ask God or to look up to him, and up to our necks about to die. And then God says, you need to look at me. In fact, let me open your eyes for you. He opens your eyes, you look at him, and he grabs you out, and by his grace. Anything to uh, boast about there? No. You start hearing someone boast about their faith, and you can start marking it down. It's not real. Because real faith that sees the hand of God at work is humbled. Is humbled. And that's why humility becomes a sign of spiritual growth, a sign of maturity, because we know from where we came, and we know what God did for us, and we don't boast. So he says, not by works, so that no one, no one can boast. And then let's look at verse 10. What does it say about you and what God has done for you to remember you were God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What would you put on that one? I know, quote the verse, right? Huh? Created by Christ? Okay. You are God's job. God's job. We did a little work this summer, emphasis on little in our house. We put, uh, I finished the wall down the, to the basement, down to the basement, notice the to the, put some trim up, fixed the handrails, painted it, Mary Jo bought a thing to put on the wall, not sure what you call that, but it's a thing. And got some carpet laid, fixed the stairs so you could put carpet on them, and then had some carpet laid. And last night, um, in our small group, um, Wendy looked down and said, oh, the stairway really looks nice. Thank you. It does? <coughs> Took all summer. <laughs> uh, but you know, you look at that and you say, okay, I, I did that with a little help from Mary Jo and Melissa. They did the painting. They helped me with the painting. And I could say, I did that. That's good. Thank you. Got a compliment. That's nice. Whose workmanship are you? Who's working on you? You? Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? You are not your own workmanship. You are God's workmanship. God is at work on you. You're his trophy. You're his clay pot he's molding. You're his stairway he's working on. That's why I like that phrase from years and long time ago. Be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. Give grace to each other, but give grace to yourself. God's not finished yet. He's still at work. And he's at work sanding off those, those, uh, those sharp places that need sanding. He's shining up the places that need shining. He's smoothing out things. He's putting paint on things. He's fixing you up. But it's his job. Now, what is the pot's job when it's on the wheel being spun by the potter? What's the pot's job? Is lay there and do what it's 
do whatever the potter tells it. Go here, go there. What did you say? Submission. Submission. You let the potter mold you. You let God shave down those sharp points. You let God work. Your job is to submit and let him work. If you're not happy with your spiritual life, it is not the workman's fault. The workman knows what he's doing. Back when we needed some uh, stage built and stairs built, I got a workman who knew what he was doing and let him work, didn't we? Said, you go do that, would you? And he just told me, get a nail, do this, do that. You get somebody who knows what he's doing to do it. Why? Because they do it right. If you start being the workman, you will fail. You have to submit to the workman, to God. You are his workmanship. You know what else that means, to be his workmanship? You know what else that means? His name is on you. When our kids were growing up, we taught them, Freemans don't pout. Convince them. We don't do that here. No kid with my name is going to pout. You get into public and you pout, it might be the last time you're in public. Now listen, people, you have Jesus' name on you. You're his workman. You be cautious what you do and don't do, what you say, what you watch, what you read, because you're his workmanship. You be cautious how you act because you're his workmanship. Be careful. You bear his name. You know how when you see a painting and it's supposed to be a famous painting, what is one of the first things you look for? The signature. Down the bottom right corner or some unique thing that this painter would do that everybody knows. Oh, and that's there, that's this painter. God has stamped you with his name and he's put his Holy Spirit in you and he said, this one's mine. And when people look at you, they see the sign and they got his name on it. What would it be like if someone were to say, that's a Rembrandt, it's got his signature, and you'd look at it and think, my sixth grader could do better than this. Rembrandt wouldn't have let it go out. He wouldn't have put his name on it. And yet so often, Christians go out and act like sixth graders, and God's got his name on it, and God is thinking, we've got to stop this fight, and we've got to stop this this activity. We've got to stop this bickering. We've got to stop this. We've got to st stop this. You're God's workmanship. What else? Look at um, 13, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you once were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. What has he done for you? Brought you into a close relationship. We do not believe like Islam about God. Their God is not our God. Their God is a make, made up God. We have a God who draws us near to himself. He is personal, personable, and can be known and interacted with. You can know God. You can interact with him. You can talk to him. You can be at school, kids, teenagers, you can be at school, and you can interact with God sitting there a teacher badgering you about something, and you can simply say, Lord Jesus, give me grace. Some kid says something in the lunchroom to you that's inappropriate and not nice. You can say, God, help me. You can interact with God at any moment, at any time. You have a relationship with him. Verse 18, what else do you have? One of the most important things in life access. Verse 18, we have access to the Father. Access is one of the most important things in life. Did you know that? Most people get a job because they know somebody. Most people get ahead in life because they know somebody. 
You have access. When you have access, you have power. When you have access, you have the ability to accomplish. So what access do you have as a Christian? What do you need to remember? You have access to the Father. You can go talk to the Father. And you can call him Father. Say, Dad. Hey, Dad. Dad. I'm kind of hurting. And Dad will say, yeah, I know. Sit down here. Dad, what can I do? Well, son, daughter. And he can tell us. You have access. One time our youngest son was uh, just getting, not, not too much trouble, but doing some dumb things, making some dumb choices, you know. He's a 10th grader at the time. I sat him down in our living room and I said, Aaron, you have two parents who love you, who are a lot smarter than you, done a lot of dumb things, learned a lot of stuff in our years. You have access to wisdom that you're being very foolish not to take advantage of. You need to learn to access the wisdom that's in this house. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, you're right, you know. And he began to ask. See, kids get to where they think they know as much or more. Isn't it interesting how kids know everything? And their brains are just mush. They don't know anything, but they think they do. You and I treat God the same way. We have access to the Father. Use your right of access. Remember, you have access. You can go to him at any time. Look at verse uh, 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. What do you have? What do you need to remember? Membership. Membership. You're a family man, a family lady. You're part of a family. It's a, there are some people I know whose family is the church, whose family aren't worth being around. They're a tough group. You love them, but you can't spend time with them. Right? There are people like that, lots of us. You say, you know what? This is family. And what do you do with family? You love them no matter what they do. You cut, him a, you cut him a break. You love him. You encourage him. You help him. Sometimes you discipline him. Sometimes you smack him. Sometimes you just have to put an arm around him and tell him you love him. But they're family. You used to tell my kids, I know that your friends are your best friends in school right now, but I'm guaranteeing you that this girl is going to be your sister all of your life. And this boy is going to be your brother all of your life. And these other kids, they ain't going to be around. You get to be 25, you won't even remember their names. Oh, you might remember them some, but family will be forever. <laughs> that can be a good and it can be a really bad thing. <laughs> family is forever. Listen, people, you and I are a part of a bigger family, the family of God, his family. And when we get to heaven, it'll be all family. And we won't be any fighting. There won't be any arguing. There won't be any sibling rivalries. Don't you just hate that? Kids fighting each other? That won't happen anymore. There won't be any competitions. There won't be any, any losers in the world. We'll all just be winners because we're all part of the family. We need to learn to treat each other like family. We care for each other, love each other. Verse 22, what's it say? The last thing. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God lives in you. Remember who lives in your house. And everywhere you go, you take him. That's a nice thing to remember. 
everywhere you go, you take him. What if the Lord were to come back? Would he be so proud to come back right now where I am? Mm. God has done great things for you. Amen? But you have to remember. So go through the list. Remember them. And when the recording starts, that's not from God, turn it off and start the other one. And if you can't remember it, get a piece of paper out and go, I used to be dead in my sins. I was dominated by the evil one. I used to gratify my cravings. I used to follow my desires. I was separated with God without hope, stuck. But he made me alive. And he seated me with Christ in the heavenlies and saved me by grace through faith and gave me a faith to believe. And, and he did it so I couldn't boast. And I'm his workmanship. He's at work in me. He's doing it. I have a relationship with him. I have access to him. I have a family I'm a part of, and he lives in me. Those are things you repeat. Those are things you play over and over.